<laughs> hey, welcome to another episode of the WP Crowd. Today we have quite a crowd of awesome people, and we are talking about over engineering and what it means. I want to do introductions, so I'm going to start with Megan. Megan, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Howdy, I'm Megan Haynes. It is a balmy, what is it, May up here? We just had that flood. We're done with that now, thankfully. Um, I'm Megan Haynes. I live in Ottawa. I am in Ottawa right now. I do many things with WordPress, including WordCamp Ottawa 2017. Come on up and see the Ottawa Valley. I promise, no floods. Awesome. Uh, and back for another week, we have Tanya. Hi there. I'm Tanya Mork. Um, I'm actually in Wisconsin, just south of Megan. <laughs> Um, let's see, I am an educator and engineer over at Know the Code. Uh, some things you can see, I'm sitting here in a balmy Wisconsin day out here on Lake Michigan in my wood paneled room. Uh, I do different things like I'm putting together a boot camp for uh, profitable WordPress developers um, and standing here and talking with you guys today again, which is always fun. Awesome. Carl? I'm Carl Alexander. Um, I'm a PHP developer, uh, WordPress, uh, WordCamp organizer in Montreal. Uh, I also write on carlalexander.ca uh, about uh, object-oriented programming and other interesting and advanced topics uh, with WordPress. Awesome. And finally, Josh. Hi, Roy. I'm Josh from uh, Caldera Labs. We are the makers of Caldera Forms, a drag and drop responsive form builder for WordPress. We have a very cute um, cat mascot, um, which apparently Roy and Megan have stickers of, and I don't. Was that it? Was that your intro? I, I, I mean, you guys crushed my spirit, so. <laughs> <laughs> All I right. Wish I had with you. My yeah. gosh. So oh my today God. we're talking about over engineering and as developers and I would say like there's definitely not just developers that can over engineer things but like every aspect of a website can be over engineered even the design could be I guess over designed but we'll call it just over engineering across the board for today. Um so I wanted to start with one question and let's just define out over engineering. Um, Josh, who is a plugin developer, uh, why don't you take a stab at defining what over engineering is, especially when it comes to, let's say, your own plugin or you know, building out something for your plugin. Right. So I think this is that weird sort of gray area where when you under engineer something, you're like, oh, it works, but then you have no skill building. Right? You're like, if I make one change to this, the whole thing falls down because I didn't follow any best practices. I don't have anything structured about what I've written. And it's all a bunch of assumptions, right? So that's sort of the inverse is you've done no work to ensure that you can add to this. And then the other side, maybe there's like this magical medium where you've put in all of the work in making sure your, um, your code is structured in a way that it's um, resilient to change, right? I think that's sort of probably the best definition of bad code is it's not resilient to changes um, over time. And so, but then you overdo that. You, you know, you're writing abstractions on abstractions on abstractions on abstractions on abstractions on abstractions um, in definitions for the sake of definitions. And like that all starts out very good and then you get to the point where you're only maintaining the system, not the like functionality. Does that make sense? I mean, there's no clear definition. It's like, other than to say when you, the things that you've done to make your code scalable and, and um, functional and maintainable get to the point where that's all you're doing is that instead of the purpose of your code. Um, I mean, I'm in a unique position um, as a teacher. I actually wrote about over engineering because I got called out on it. Um, just because of what I'm trying to teach, because if you're trying to teach something with WordPress that doesn't really exist with WordPress, um, you're stuck having to do that kind of layer of abstraction that you were talking about, Josh, uh, just so you, that you can have a kind of foundation that you can 
teach on. And uh, that that's obviously, you know, a complex um, and there's no there's no right or wrong answer in my mind. Obviously, over engineering, um, Tanya also uh, wrote about it is just if you overdo it and it's hard to maintain because it's just needlessly complex, um, then that's the kind of extreme side of over engineering as well. Uh, and I'm definitely uh, guilty of that more often than not um, because yeah, it's mo much more fun to learn over engineering something than it is to just do the job and then leave it as at that. Can you over engineer something to the point where not just is it hard to maintain, but it now becomes uh, you start getting detrimental performance, like your performance actually decreases because you've actually over-engineered it? Yeah, for sure. sure. Yeah. Absolutely, you can do that. Um, uh, what ends up happening when you over so this debate's gone on for as long as I've been in engineering, right? Uh, what's over-engineering for somebody? And everybody has a different definition. What it really comes down to is this, is can you maintain it? What's the cost of what you're building? That's it. That's if it's too complex and it takes you too long to maintain it, if it takes you too long to take your libraries and plop them into your code and be able to integrate those. If you make a change, like Josh says, and now everything is just too, uh, too rigid and it breaks other things, then it's, it's, it, has a, it has a structural problem to it and it can break all the way down, right? So that's really what over-engineering is, is that we've just made it too complex and now too costly. So there's that flip side too of I'm trying to apply some design pattern to this simple little thing I'm trying to build and now it's too complex for the context of what we're trying to build. So we have to think about it from that premise too. The other thing I found over the years as I'm working with people is the context of how they work. Where are they at? What's their skill level? What's their culture of their business, right? So if it works for them and they're highly productive in the way that they're building code and they can easily jump in and quickly produce and make profit off of that, then who's to say they're over-engineering it or under-engineering it? It works for them. Nice. I like that point. You bring up over-engineering in terms of costs. And from my point of view, and if it's a design and sort of architecture point of view, yeah, you can very easily get caught up in over-designing and over-developing. Or I see it commonly with people with logos and stuff. They just keep rebuilding and rebuilding and rebuilding. It's like, it's not about the logo. It's about if the logo is achieving business results for you, right? So I don't know. That's kind of, that's sort of my approach for how I think about it. Yeah, I, I agree. And so I see engineers do a lot of this. We'll sit and we'll reiterate, reiterate, reiterate. Like Josh says, we'll keep abstracting and, oh, I got to keep adding this. And it's not necessarily that we're building bigger features. It's that we're just adding layers upon layers upon layers. Yeah, yeah eventually it's, it's like a seven layer dip and you got to just stop. You just got to stop and eat the dip. I... I mean, I'm not opposed to abstraction, obviously. Like, I, it's something I enjoy. But, like, it, so here's the example that I was complaining at Roy last night about. Is that, like, three days ago, I was like, Shh, I don't trust anything that's coming out of this API, right, going into the DOM. Um, because there's no automatic setters for when, right, to get the defaults in. Um, the structure's unpredictable. And it's because I, in PHP land, I don't have a well-structured entity. So I ran in and wrote these really well-structured entities that, you know, fall back to defaults, make sure that there's not too, right, there's like a pseudo arbitrary amount of items in each, or what was originally an array, like each key, but they, they're meaningful, right, depending on what type uh, they are. Um, and so I wrote a whole bunch of really good objects that nest together into the one main one, you know, like one, one object that has constructed of other objects, um, but then, of course, I wrote a two array method in each of these, right? I mean, obviously, like, it is where I also use the, like, arrayable interface. Um, and so it all becomes one predictable array when it gets returned. Right, so I spent all this time to turn an array into an array, um, but it was more predictable in what would happen. From it. And then I spent all, and then I was like, great, this is awesome. I spent all this time in the UI, and then I decided to, like, add a save button to my UI, which I thought was a nice feature. Um, it took me a couple of days to get there to the point where I had anything to save. And then I realized like, oh crap, 
it comes back from JavaScript web as an array. Right, like I had a setter in the model that was throwing an error because it was supposed to be passed this object when I was passing it an array. So I had to go through all six classes and add a from array method, right? Like a factory to go from this array that came back and did all the same validation. And for a second I had this like, did I over engineer this, right? Like this is a very, this is pushing that gray line where it's like, I built six, eight classes to create an array instead of an array. And now I'm getting back an array from the doc. Um, and, but I stand by making those from array methods, right? Adding that to the interface and then implementing it in all these different places because it applied the same validation going in and out, right? But that's frighteningly close to being over engineered because like then what happens, right? It gets serialized to the database. I think uh, <clears throat> I have a little bit less complex scenario. Um, obviously when you're not working, when you're working in an environment with a bunch of other developers, uh, what Tanya said really plays a big role. Where are they at? What's the least common complexity, right? Or the least common engineering that allows all of us to maintain the code efficiently? Um, and so with WordPress specifically, we were looking over a project and there was just actions everywhere. And uh, we started to add more actions in to actually make it more extendable. But then we came across an error on a site and we just could not for the life of us figure out why this error was coming up. And while we were debugging it, this is really where the over-engineering kind of played a big role, was just debugging the whole thing. It was like, okay, this runs this action, which then runs this action, which then you know ties into this filter, which then ends up with this action. But on this thing, this is overridden because it removes it. And so there's another action which takes its place, but it's in another file. And this is in the theme, but this is in a plugin. So like going back and forth between, you know, three themes and, you know, a handful of plugins uh, just to trace down like where this error was coming from. And it was a simple, simple fix in the end. Like once we found like the, the last action that ran, it was a simple of like just rethinking how we actually spit out the DOM or the HTML markup. But just getting to that place was, it's just a nightmare. And I've also likened that strategy, or I've had that similar experience with WooCommerce a lot in the past, where I feel like WooCommerce is kind of over-engineered to make it simple, but at the same time, there's so many actions, it becomes a little bit hard to track everything. And it was just like a repeat cycle of all of that. You know, that's a good point, actually. Um, and not to, you know, I use WooCommerce, I love it. It's a good plugin. But it almost has been engineered to the point where you now need to engineer it on top of WordPress. And it's cool because it's, you know, we have a guide, it's handy for us to implement. But yeah, when you come down to technicalities, now it's a little bit over engineered and it's harder to do things and trace a stack easier. I mean, okay. I like all these kind of event base uh, architecture. I mean, the plugin API is basically event based. Um, if you overuse them, you get this kind of obfuscation. It's not necessarily over engineering. It's like, it's just a trade off. Um, there's entire paradigms like CQRS uh, that are entirely based on this idea that you just send a message out like you would in a filter or an action and then things happen and you have no control over it unless you have some event sourcing or, or more complex behavior to audit everything on top of it. So it can be complex to, to deal with that, but it's kind of also the strength of WordPress is that it makes it really ex easy to extend, which is probably what WooCommerce wants as well, right? They, they need a lot of extension points and things like that. It just makes it really complex uh, to deal with that. And the, I was thinking of something while we were, uh, while everybody was talking, there's this really, I, I mentioned it in, in my own article about um, comp, uh, over engineering, but there's really this, this excellent talk by this guy named uh, Rick Hickey. Um, that's called Simple Made Easy. And it's about simple versus complex. Um, those, um, <laughs> uh, those, there's a difference between the two. And it's very important to understand that 
um, things can be complex without necessarily being over-engineered. And I'm sorry for all the beeping. <laughs> well, so I have, another, I have another use case I kind of wanted to discuss, uh, which I think really plays a role in um, paradigm. But if we look at, if we look at uh, uh, functional programming versus like, uh, you know, OOP programming, um, for example, in the same theme I was working on, there was a, a file which gets included, which the whole file is essentially um, uh, actions and their callback function. So it was like function, add action for that callback function. And that was the whole file. And it was structured in a way that that file was actually consolidated to one aspect of uh, functionality, right? So like theme functionality, it was encapsulated with this file, but it was all function, add action, function, add action, function, add action. So my question was, or is, uh, and I'm not sure if this is, is it over engineering to turn that all into like one big class, right? Because typically we like, we tend to use classes for that kind of thing, right? Um, you know, create a class, have the methods, they're all consolidated together, they're all related. So where do you think that there's a line in between that's uh, saying, hey, that's over-engineering it, this works fine as is, as you know, functional programming, or do we take the next step and say, it's not over-engineering, it's actually better engineering to make it one big class instead? Well, I think that, goes back to, I hear conversations a lot about, do I write in OOP? Do I write in procedural? Do I write in functional? And I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter. I tell people that all the time. It doesn't matter. Okay. So I prefer writing in OOP. I've had teams that write in functional. I have teams that write in procedural. It doesn't matter at that point. It all fits with how did you start your architecture? How does everything we've well, there's a phone ringing somewhere. Sorry about that. How does everything weave through and how does your team or yourself, if you're a solo programmer and you're working by yourself, how does that weave for yourself? Okay. So if I'm very proficient in one, <laughs> if I'm very proficient in one, then that's the way that I should be coding it. So if it's working for you right now with everything in one file written in functional why would you go back to me? That's over engineering it. When I go back and I keep tinkering and I keep tinkering and I keep tinkering, oh my God, it's I'm increasing so my cost. I'm so happy you said that because so rarely do people say such um, um, points of view that, yeah, code is code. Code is like, you know, at the end of the day, we'll re-architect it. We'll re-engineer it when we need B2. You're trying to ship an MVP always. Like don't spend too much time. It's the 80-20 rule, right? Don't spend too much time doing that. Yeah, I don't know how many times I've been hired to come in and help an engineering team and sit down with them and say, stop re-architecting. Stop it. Pick a path. Let's set up our architecture. What you're doing is you're constantly reiterating and you're just increasing your cost, right? So we just keep tinkering at it and tinkering at it. Stop that. Instead, let's go with what our architecture is going to be and keep going, right? We can, we can iterate to make things better. You're always going to make things a little bit better. You have to, because here's the other thing with it. So we say we want something to be extensible. Well, here's the thing. Code is always going to change. Things are going to change. I can set up an API today. I'll tell you what, next year that API is going to be different. That's why we talk about dependencies on third-party APIs, because they are going to change. We're going to change them too. Okay, so when we over-engineering things, we're talking about, okay, I have to anticipate future changes. Well, you can't anticipate. Nice. Well so said. if you keep trying to build it to anticipate what will happen down the road, all you're doing is increasing your cost and making it more complex. You do have to anticipate some things, have to. But we, there's that fine line of where, whoops, I went too far. Right. And I wanted to get back to what Tanya said before, where she was like, what, 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 like, it does like if procedural works for you, why keep going with it? And I always I get I get people like message me they're like, Josh, should I make this OOP? And I'm like, my my two responses are always that have nothing to do with anything else they said, right? They say because blah 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 blah. And I always just ignore everything else. And I say two things. One, what problem are you solving? Right? Like what's your engineering problem that you're trying to solve that a different code architecture would 
provide benefit and does an OOP approach provide that benefit. And the other thing I say is, what about rewriting these functions in, in, inside of a closure call cl with class brief keyword in front of it? Makes this object oriented. And I don't just say that to be um, verbose, right? To make a distinction between class and using classes and object oriented programming being two different things. I make that point to say that one of the strengths of classes is organization. One of the strengths of classes is um, using object oriented programming. And but these two things are not magical benefits that come with using the class keyword. Um, and so, but I want people to start thinking about what about moving your code to a different pattern will give you, will make it object oriented. And does that, is that happening when you use a class? Like, is it object oriented? If so, or if not, do I care? Do you care? Does it solve your problem, right? Getting back to your first question of what problem are you trying to solve? Is this solution actually object oriented and do you care? And would making it object oriented solve your problem better? So one more one more question. Oh, Carl, unless you want to speak, Carl. Uh, I mean, there's Dr. a question Carl, talk. about happiness as well, right? Um, you know, happy developers are productive developers uh, to a certain extent. Obviously, like Tanya said, um, you know, we're, we engineers, we love just taking something and we're like, oh, we see all the flaws in it. And we're like, okay, I'm scrapping all of it, scrapping, I'm restarting. This is, uh, I'm notoriously, uh, I've done it myself a whole bunch of times, uh, just in WordPress, uh, before I even started writing. Um, there's a lot of iterations that that we have that people will never see because it's just I've learned from them, um, and I'm in a comfortable area at this point. But the the point of the matter is that sometimes um, you're just happier doing these slightly more complex things, and if you're happier and you're more productive, then you know who am I to who are we to judge you on that? And like Tanya said, if you're happy doing procedural, um, do procedural. Um, that's always the premise I feel that people forget, especially with WordPress when you're trying to teach object-oriented programming. Like, you can do something else. You're not stuck doing this other paradigm. Um, it's not better. It's just different. Yeah, and what you'll find, if I can just kind of talk on that too, is that patterns come and go. <laughs> I've seen a lot come and a lot go in my 30 some years, let me tell you. So what you, you don't want to get wrapped up in a particular pattern. You just want to, you want to build the most robust code that you can that solves a particular problem that's cost effective and that you can maintain. You can, I always tell people, if you can read it, if you can reuse it, and if you can maintain it, bam, you, you've got it. That's it. It's, it's really simple. And that's the other thing is I can build, and I used to build some extremely complex things. I used to build a lot of automated um, artificial intelligence systems. Those are very, very complex, but we built it in very simple, small little packets of code. And we just were able to piece it all together to get it done. So complexity, you can still build in a simplistic way. Now, you may look at it and go, well, that looks pretty complex to me, but read it. Can you read it? So if I write an NOOP and I have things that are very abstracted, can you still read it? If yes, and I can bring someone into my team, that's going to help me and my company or myself to be more productive. So I was going to ask one more question, um, and I'm going to try to get this answered very quickly because we're almost out of time. Um, but I was curious, we're talking about plugins and stuff, and uh, one of the things that uh, you see a lot of are boilerplates, right, for not just plugins, but themes and stuff. And out of the box, a lot of them are kind of, like I always thought they were always over-engineered. Like, I love Tom McFarlane with a passion, not as much as Carl does, but I do love Tom. Um, and I looked at his boilerplate for a plugin uh, when he first came out with it and I was just like, this is ridiculous. Like this is insane code, you know, like it's just so much going on, but then I don't know. There's kind of like that thing where it's like, you feel like it's over-engineered till you start coding. And then eventually you get to the point where you're like, okay, yeah, no, this all makes sense. Like this all should be there. 
So how do you compensate for that in the kind of boilerplates? Do you, do you tell people to use them and work your, and say, hey, this is not over-engineered. You're not engineered until you hit this level. Or do you say, don't use a boilerplate if you feel like the boilerplate vanilla, like by itself, is over-engineered? Well, my boilerplate's even more engineered than, than that one. <laughs> so but, um, I'm at the point now where I have like a bunch of components that I just copy in because one, you have no choice. So one of the problems right now that you highlighted is like, it's not Did we lose Carl mid-sentence? This is usually what happens when Carl starts really getting into juice. No, right no because I was resisting the urge to accuse him of not knowing that there's a thing called Composer, um, and that scared him off. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, thinks <laughs> Are you back with us, Carl? You yeah, froze on us, Carl. You, you froze. Start your sentence over again. Carl, overdrive. Where did, I, where did I cut off? Right at the beginning. Um, Just start over. Just start over. Let's pretend like Roy's going to edit this, but he's not. Yeah, yeah. Enjoy your editing job, Roy. Um, so I have even a more crazier boilerplate than what Tom uh, made. I remember when he came out with it, and I was like, hey, finally somebody decoupled actions from the rest of the code. That's a good first step. Um, and that was like the only thing that was different with his new version. But uh, you're kind of stuck with the boilerplate um, with WordPress because there's just no way to uh, code reuse outside just copy and pasting, you know, whatever reusable code that you've developed, you have to copy it from project to project. It's, you can't use Composer, um, you can't- Why can't you use Composer, Carl? Because WordPress core doesn't let you use Composer unless you use a Bedrock project. Why can't you use copy but, paste? Uh, but Carl. I, I, I'm sorry to be a jerk about this, but it's like Composer has strong WordPress support um, and there's nothing in core that prevents you from using it. Well, what happens if you have namespace conflicts? Like you develop two plugins, same library, two different versions of the library, same namespace. What happens? Uh, the same, I mean, that's not a Composer issue. That's a PHP issue, right? Like PHP doesn't have a predictable way of getting which one it's going, it is going to be used when you add to the auto loader. And you can have that problem when you copy and paste too. So it's yeah. really not a composer well, you issue. Can have a, yeah, you can't have that problem if you copy paste, but, um, but composer is supposed to, to resolve dependencies and it's out, of the question, it's out of the picture if you develop three plugins with three different component libraries at different, that are in different versions. So to clarify, because I think this is an important point, um, your argument is that because WordPress doesn't have full stack Composer management based, baked into core. You think to avoid this PHP problem that Composer can present, it is better to cut and paste modules and then rename space them. Yeah. Okay. That's what I was, that was legitimately the answer to my question. I was for. I'm sorry I cut you off, but like no, it was confusing. That's fine. Um, but if, if you use Composer, you wouldn't have to do that. Um, you just specify whatever you need to and that's it. Um, but that's a, another complex uh, discussion. There's a plugin right now for Composer that lets you rename space uh, libraries. That's interesting, but I haven't played with it yet. All right. Well, Composer seems like a great podcast idea, so we should probably do that one time, um, but not today, because today we're out of time. So. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to our channel. If you're watching on our website, go to YouTube and subscribe to our channel anyway. Um, and that is it. That so, like button, like yeah. thumbs and subscribe, guys. Yeah, yeah, all, yeah, yeah. Of, yes. all of that stuff. And follow all of the peoples on Twitter and Facebook or whatever, and know the code and Caldera and et cetera, et cetera. Um, Hashtag Carl2016. Yeah. What there about the WP crowd? That's a good one to follow. Oh, yeah, the WP crowd, obviously. Yeah. All right. Well, I will see you guys next week. Thank you.